So it allowed us early on to kind of realize like, is this a business or a job? Like we have to kind of treat this like a business. And truthfully, that was just some, you know, we just kind of got lucky early on with those thoughts. Uh, now that's all I do. Hey guys, Nicole Spinoza with The Short Sell Queen, and today I have a special guest with me. I'm so excited to bring in Mike Hamright. Um, he has a lot of titles, um, but specifically with Investor Fuel, and we have a mastermind that's coming up that I'm going to be speaking at, so I'm very excited. Um, but I'm mostly excited to just sit down with you, Mike, and, and really talk. He has so much experience. Um, if you're a real estate investor and you're watching, watching or listening to this, you're going to get a lot of information about lead generation, which is the number one thing that real estate investors need to know, right? Because the hardest part is getting the deal. Yep. Once you have the deal, you have to figure out what to do with it. But, you know, of course, creating those leads and especially in competitive markets like DFW, where we are, like, how do you stand out? So we're going to really dive into Mike's story. So thank you so Mike, so much, Mike, for yeah, coming excited, today. Yeah, excited to be here. Yeah. So why don't, for people that don't know you, why don't you introduce yourself? Yeah, uh, I'm Mike Hambright. I've been a real estate investor since really 2007, 2008. We started full time. Uh, I have a, if, if you if you followed me at all, I talked many times about my backstory, which is we're kind of, my wife and I are kind of corporate refugees. We um, were in corporate America for a long time. And then, uh, you know, I got fired from my dream job, a job I loved, and then went to another company where we were flying high and then they filed for bankruptcy. And I was just kind of like, okay, I got to take matters into my own hands. And that's when we started uh, real estate investing. So 2008, really full time. And for a number of years, really, really our first year, we flipped like 65 or 70 houses here. In just Dallas. right off the gate, you just yeah. Flipped. But we, you know, we That's were. Crazy. I, I will say that uh, there's a there, there's there's a bigger story there. There's an yeah. asterisk next to that, right? Of like just how hard we were working to make that happen. I can't imagine. And some of it was just like losing the job. Then another company. My son was born. It's like oh my god, we got all this. Yeah. We went from like nothing to worry about in the world to like. You know, Everything. You have to make it happen, right? So it was just like a lot of pressure, fairly new marriage at the time. We'd only been married for a couple of years. And so it was like the first time I really had to step up as a husband yeah. and a new dad. And my wife did too. And so we just kind of had to make it happen. Uh, but it was also a weird time. 2008 um, was everybody was running away. Like all the yep. lenders were leaving. When I, I was fortunate to get started that as I got a relationship with a lender that even though all this stuff was happening in the market, they were still okay. I mean, they weren't lending to a lot of people, but I was like yeah. a friend of a friend, somebody that got me in the door at a bank, and we had a private lender, and so we were actually pretty well capitalized. Um, so it was, you know, there wasn't as much competition then, and uh, we worked really, really hard to do that, no doubt. Yeah. But it was just a different time. It was such yeah. a different time. I got in the business in 2009, and I just remember the amount of REOs and just the different business models. I mean, I remember investors just, you know, every day, right? Because we had all yeah. we had was REO listings, and just it was so it was a lot easier back then yeah. for for investors. Yeah. And then as competition just started increasing, when the market started getting better, and then you know short sales started hitting the market, and then the strategies were different. It, like they're especially DFW specifically because there's so much opportunity here. For sure. There's it's so infiltrated with with investors. Yeah. You know what's interesting is even back then when we started, we focused we were all in on paid advertising, which oh, I know really? is what we're going to talk about today. And so, yeah, like I didn't ha I didn't know you then to work no, on yeah. short sales because we had lots of leads. We tried to work somewhere like oh my god, yeah, they just weren't they just weren't worth it for us because we didn't know what we were doing. Right. And then of course back then every realtor in town all of a sudden was a short sale expert, and you're like, oh, no, I remember. You're not. <laughs> I remember all of the REO brokers that I would work with. They were like, oh, okay, I'm a shoe in because I, I work with lenders, and and then they realized, holy shit, this is totally different. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and like you said, you know, they had to, they, you either adapt or you die, and so they they started doing it, and then very quickly, you know, stopped right. doing it. Yeah. But even back then, I mean, most of the investors that I work with now, they were processing their own short sales. Mm. They had, you know, especially if you do marketing on a high level, yeah. and then that ended just as quick because right. the banks caught on to like, hey, you can't negotiate your own deals right, right, because right. of the conflict of interest. Yeah. So, yeah. 
Um, but yeah, that's interesting because, you know, I, I always, I always love talking to people that went that route because mm-hmm. I did everything. Well, I was broke, so I had to do everything organic right. <laughs> when I started, I was in my young twenties. So I didn't have a bunch of money to really start, you know, six figures of marketing. So yeah. tell me, um, especially for the people listening, we have a lot of real estate investors that we, because we have relationships with them, um, that always ask me like, how do I find these deals? Like this yeah. is, they're hungry. So when you first started, I'm sure just, you know, like you said briefly, you had your background of just needing to survive and trying to create, right. where did you go from there? Like, how did you start? Yeah, it was one of those uh, where we, it's not that we had a, a lot of money either. We yeah. were just living on savings and burning through savings yeah. that we'd saved up. So there was a limit, right? And so we just got really scrappy. We had uh, this hole in the wall office in Farmer's Branch. Like you, you, you would know it if you saw the area, it's just like, a junker, but we yeah. were there for like six years, you know, it was oh, just wow. like, you know, we don't have customers coming in and out of our office. So we just needed a place to yeah. work that wasn't at home. But, um, you know, I think we knew enough because of my corporate background. I mean, I can knock it now and say, well, I didn't even need to go to college or grad school or all the things that I did prior to that. Right. But the truth is, is, um, it's hard to know, like, what did you learn during those periods or like how to think about things, critical thinking things that helped. And one of the things that, that I know we got some benefit from from corporate America was just thinking bigger, right? Like we, yeah. we worked for a big, I mean, my last kind of major job was for a multi-billion dollar company. It was a big company. So I don't want to say that to say that there were departments and teams mm-hmm. and managers, Structure. several levels of manager, and the, just systems and processes and things like that. So it allowed us early on to kind of realize like, is this a business or a job? Like we have to kind of treat this like a business. And truthfully, that was just some, you know, we just kind of got lucky early on with, those thoughts uh, now, that's all I do. And, you know, I have a, a mastermind and right. generate leads for hundreds of investors across the country. There's a lot of things that I do. And usually what I talk about is how to build a business like a business because everybody wants to get into this business for the freedom. Everybody yeah. wants to have a life that seems like you're lucky, even though, right. you know, overnight success, like 15 years in the making, right? It's like, yeah, uh, you didn't true. see, you didn't see the whole story here. Right. You didn't see that say. office <laughs> right. for six years that I was you there. You didn't see yeah. how hard I worked. I look like I'm 47, but I'm actually 27 now. Yeah. Uh, but, um, uh, so, um, you know, now I teach on those things of building a real business. Cause a lot of people say, what I was saying is a lot of people say that they want to own a business, but they really right. own a job. Yeah. The whole hustle strategy, that might be a season that you have to go through. And we hustled hard for yeah. years, but now looking back, there's things I could have done faster for us to create a real business faster. You know, yeah. we were doing plenty of volume to be a real business for sure. But um, that's what people want is freedom, time, freedom, financial freedom, you know, all those things. And you just can't get there with hustle. No, hundred percent. And I think you hit the nail on the head with it's a different season. Yeah. So I'm definitely all for roll up your, your sleeves and yeah. put in the work because you have to in the beginning oh, for sure. when you guys are, are grinding, like you're building the business, right. but that's not sustainable. Right. And I think that people get lost in that because yeah. like you said, they want that freedom, but then they en- end up working, you know, 80 hours a week instead of the yeah. other way. And I think especially with social media, people get it's almost like they um, they put a glamour to the don't sleep, right? Like right. I haven't slept. I'm like, yeah. okay, well that sucks for you, like yeah, because the yeah. successful the people that I know that are super successful, um, they're buying their time back, that's and, right. and that's the goal. But right. it's so hard because you get into this, and as entrepreneurs, we need structure, but we don't know how to create it. And so yeah. that's awesome about your training because you're teaching, especially with your corporate background, you're like, hey, you have to implement into this so that you can actually create a business that's sustainable. For sure. And not just $10,000 here, $20,000 right. here, and then you're broke. Yeah. And, and, you know, one of the things that you asked was, like, uh, how do you get it started? So if you think, I, I hate to use a casino analogy, like, a, I'm not a big gambler, but I have. Yeah gamble in the past, but there's a strategy where people like, let's just say you started off with a hundred dollars and you're like making $5 bets playing back blackjack. When you start to win, people start to double and triple their bets because you start to go up faster and you, you're presumably kind of playing with the house's money. Right. Right. And that's how you move things up. And we did something. It's not, we never made that analogy like, Hey, at the casino, here's what we do. But that is in fact what we did is we made money. Our first deal, we put it all back into the business and we just put it back in the business for a long time. And I mean, to be honest, uh, um, we live very frugally, like we live well below our means. And even then we lived very frugally. And so we just kind of plowed it into the business because we knew there was this season of right. building that has to happen. And yep. that's kind of how, you know, that's the way that I know. That's the way that I teach. And 
there's probably other ways, but I think that at the end of the day, like don't go make 10,000 bucks on your first deal yeah. and start looking at Lambos. Like that's just, <laughs> it doesn't make sense, right? <laughs> no, it, it doesn't. And I, and I think, again, it's just like the keeping up mentality where right. people see other investors and, you know, what, what do you see gurus do, right? Like they're taking pictures with the Lambos and they're that lifestyle, pitching yeah. that lifestyle. And the reality is there's nothing wrong with nice things, but, no, not at all. but you know, do, put money in things that are going to cash flow, put money in, th in your business, right. like you're saying, as you're creating it right. to buy leads, you know, so that you can yeah. actually have a business that is sustainable. So exactly. when you first started uh, doing paid advertisement, like where did you go? Like what was your, what is the first so thing So mostly did? mail, uh, mail, online, mail. Legion, pay, pay per click. Cause mail is very, um, I mean, you could target it. You could target yeah. like the areas you want to be in specifically. You can target the types of houses, age of houses, things like that. And now we're like, we're as advanced as you can get with targeting motivation at a level that nobody is doing right now. But that for a long time, I mean, this is fairly recent in the past two years that we do this now because yeah. technology's evolved to a point to where we could do it. And just our knowledge has evolved to like, how do you take it to the next level? Like how do you keep up, upping your game and getting 1% better every day? But early on it was just, um, it was easy because in a market like Dallas-Fort Worth or any large markets, you know, there's, uh, I don't know how many households there are. There's almost 8 million people here, so probably 3 million households anyway in DFW, right? Yeah. And so there's a there's a, a ton of people you can send mail to, and as you start to increase your marketing budget, you could just throttle it up, and like the next month we're going to raise our budget, raise our budget, without, um, you know, like if you're, if you're cold calling or texting, you have to find more people. Like you have to right. find people, train them. By the way, it's a revolving door. You're constantly trying to find those people anyway because they keep right. quitting because you're being told to F off all day long. Yeah, no kidding. So <laughs> mail is like one of the easiest things to scale. Yeah. And I used to say pay-per-click was just as easy, but it's not anymore. If people, as you start to scale your, uh, your online spend, like you really get hammered by Google because you're just competing with so many people. Yeah. That. Now, not that you're not competing with direct mail, but the post office isn't limiting how much mail you can send, right? Google does. I Yeah, there's so many restrictions, especially like constantly, you know, having to fix your Google ads. Like, right. the, uh, oh my gosh, I, we, we had we had ads going for a while and then we just went back to what we were doing, what we know right. what we're doing um, yeah. that, that works for us. Um, but when it comes to mailers, I, I think too that there's a lot less competition. Tell me if I'm wrong because I feel like people got away from that and then now with COVID and everything, do you see like the numbers, the response rates going up because people are home so more? So it's hard to know. There's a lot of noise, right? In, yeah. in response rates, like inventory is way down too. Right. People are staying put longer. They're yeah. just like not deciding to move as fast. Right. And it's harder to move now. You know, I would say our average seller isn't moving into a new build, right? right? So new build construction is down across the country, but um, that impacts like the whole like supply chain of houses, right? Like this person didn't move up to their next house and this person didn't move up. So everybody's just kind of staying put yeah. back at where they are more so. Right. And so, um, you know, it's hard right now. There is no silver bullet. I mean, we do something yeah. very unique. Uh, we work with a lot of the top investors in the country for sure. Um, but there is no silver bullet. I mean, sometimes when I talk about stuff, people believe that, oh, it sounds like it's really easy. It's like, no, nothing is easy. No, nothing but, in this business. You know, <laughs> but like you need every advantage you can get. And so I don't, I think a lot of real estate investors, especially if they're kind of younger in their career or earlier in their career, you know, they think that there is some easy button out here somewhere and I just need to find it. Yep. And it's like, there's really not. You just need to get more comfortable with dealing with chaos because yeah. the chaos and the difficulty isn't gonna change. It's just how you process it in your mind. Okay. Uh, I love that you said managing chaos because that was literally in the description for the new admin that I put on. Like, can you hand manage chaos? And right. then in I'm the sure, interviews, I'm sure the short sale world, it's like oh my to God. another level. <laughs> well, it was funny because that was in, my, in every interview I asked that question, like, how do you manage chaos? Because that's what it is. You're getting every which direction, and you have to figure out not only just when you're when you're trying to you know create leads and create business but then managing them right. you know and like you said you're just wasting money if you're you're scaling or i think we talked about this before about how when you're scaling you're just wasting money and a lot of times scaling will kill a business i mean i yeah. know personally the people aren't ready yeah for yeah sure. i know personally like that was always the focus right when i got in i was like i just want to be as big as possible mm -hmm. i want to keep growing and then i got humbled really quick when i had to slow things down or even you know really shut down completely because 
because right. we couldn't handle it right. and we didn't have the people or the systems in place to handle it Yeah, because sure. everybody wants the opportunity, but they don't understand what it takes when you do it on a large scale. Yeah. A lot of real estate investors do that too. They, they start to make a little bit of money yeah. and they just throw it at something. They're yep. like, Oh, I'm going to get, I'm going to get a virtual assistant or I'm going to get yeah. five virtual assistants. And then like two months later, like, Oh, that didn't work out. I fired them all. And we're like, well, did you trade them? Like, yeah. did you tell them? Well, no, I just, you know, they just thought, well, I just threw money. Get on it, the right? phone and call. <laughs> <laughs> right. So a lot of times I think, um, that we just throw money at stuff cause we've yeah. got it, but it's like the foundation has to be set for yeah. how you handle those things. Right. And so, you know, even back to, um, something we we're talking about a minute ago, if you think of your business, you know, one of the things that I tell people is like create an org chart of what your business looks like. And you're going to see, you put, put the person's name that's responsible for it. And you're going to see you, 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 like all yeah. over the place. You're going to have like a million your seats. Hands is, uh, right. So it's like, true. why is yeah. that your job? Uh, but start to, if this is how you create a real business is you start to put on there, you know, uh, sales manager, whatever, uh, admin, whatever, whatever the positions are in your business. And, you know, maybe your name is on there, but put like what you would have to pay somebody to do that job every day, like full time. Right. Right. And so if you're not paying yourself that all those amounts, then you don't have a real business. You have a job. So your business, you, you need to set your business up in such a way and you could go set up a bunch of bank accounts or, you know, our, our buddy David Richter has uh, Profit First where they talk about yep. setting up a bunch of accounts, like set aside money for your taxes, set aside money for, to pay yourself, pay yourself first, like all these things. Uh, but you could do that. Like this is the salesperson's role. This is the other person's role. And if you can't support that infrastructure, then you don't have a business. You're just taking it off the skin of your back, right? Yeah, I learned that the hard way. So when I started my business, when I was doing the short sales, you know, of course, short sales are a different breed. Yeah. So when I got up to, I think, 30 listings a month, um, I, w I couldn't scale it anymore. And I'm like, why? And I had employees, but I literally had my hand in everything. And I didn't realize that it was me as a leader that was failing because I wasn't enabling them. First of all, they should have never been in that role to begin with. I just right. kept, you know, promoting out of loyalty and like we had a great culture, but that was it. They didn't have, the, I didn't identify the right skill set for each job. Yeah, yeah. And then, so what was happening was they would check with me like, okay, can I do this next? And I was doing their job and my job and all this other stuff. And I was wondering why I'm working so much and why I'm like, hello, you know, do something. And it was, right. it was because of me and yep. I had the worst job. <laughs> um, and I literally like shut down twice. Like I fired everyone at once. And this was like part of like my story as I created this <laughs> where I was like, okay, I read, um, scaling up and I, and there was like a really powerful question that I asked in that book. And it said, if you were to rehire everyone in, in the position that they're in, would you rehire them? Mm -hmm. And I was like, no, I wouldn't hire any of them. And yeah. It was like this wake up call. Like, yep. what am I doing? Like, I really liked them. We, we, you know, left on great terms, but they were, they, they did it out of loyalty to me, but they hated it. And it was just awful. Yeah. So. Back to the org chart thing. That's an important step Huge. is find those roles and then write the job description mm -hmm. for that. And I'm guilty of that too. I've done it for a long time and we yeah. still do it to some level. Yeah. It's like you have somebody that you really like, mm -hmm. you want them to work with you and for you. Um, and you start to adapt the role cause you're like, well, they're not really good at this. So I'll do right. that part. And you start to make these justifications as to why you should do something instead of the person you're paying for it right. or why you should change the role cause they're not the right fit. And the truth is it's really hard to scale if it you is. start making these exceptions for things because then that person leaves and you're trying to backfill some role that was made unique for that person. Right. And it's like, I don't, I can't find this person, you know, <laughs> this person so you start to change the roles. It's like yeah. the role, the seat is the seat. Like yeah. what has to happen in that position to run your company efficiently? It's not like, and I used to say it, I used to say, I'm looking for good athletes. If I find a really good person, I'll find a role for you in my company. And that's because I was adapting the role yep. to fit the athlete. Right. And I, you know, I've got some good athletes. I, anybody that works for me now, I don't want to say anything negative about them. They're great yeah. folks, but I've had a bunch that I thought were good athletes and they just weren't. Right. And no, a hundred percent. And and I remember I had to be really clear of what kind of skills does this role, in, you know, entitle. And then I have to make sure that I'm training them because something you said yeah. earlier that just as like a really young entrepreneur with no business experience, no anything, just like that drive to like create. And right. I was really good at my job, yep. but being really good at your job or being a really good salesperson doesn't mean you're a good leader or a business owner. No doubt. Like no doubt. at all. Yeah. And the only thing is, is that I'm just stubborn. Right. And I'm, I think my tenacity and just a lot of wine was the reason why yeah. <laughs> I was able to get through <laughs> yeah. it and just you're buying it by the barrel too. Oh yeah. my gosh. Like too much, but you know, that and high blood pressure, but 
But besides that, it was one of those things where I'm like, okay, I learned, I crashed and burned so many times where I realized, okay, the problem is me. Like I'm not training them. I, the way I run things as an entrepreneur, I'm like a get it done girl. So I can't have that perspective and, and hire people like that. Right. Because then no one's there to organize and be the integrator. And so that was very humbling too, because I think, and I see that in so many sales, sales people, like I see that in so many young entrepreneurs where, you know, real estate investors that are like, Hey, I'm hungry and they're great, but they want it it out, but they don't have that structure and they don't know how to create the systems. And so they need something like what you're talking about where, and, and if you guys are listening and that's you, you know, Mike actually has a phenomenal training. Well, he has several training programs. So why don't you talk about the event that's coming up? So I have a few events uh, yeah. coming up. So Talk about the those. event that you're speaking at, Million Dollar Meeting. <laughs> yes. So we're hosting a Million Dollar Meeting. Now, truthfully, most of the stuff that I do at these days, I've worked with new real estate investors for a long time. We have um, my very first kind of online business was FlipNerd, yeah. FlipNerd.com. We've been doing podcasts for actually over eight years now. And there's a ton of information there, but we, we I really don't have anything to sell new investors anymore. I mean, yeah. I really only work with more experienced investors. So we host an event. Um, uh, this year, this actually be our fourth year called Million Dollar Meeting, and Nicole's actually actually coming to speak. So excited to have her there. Um, it's our fourth year, and we have you know the setup is kind of like this: two full, very full days, uh, ten speakers a day, twenty speakers overall, some amazing networking opportunities, and um, it's unlike other events because we really don't have anything for sale there. We kind of told all our speakers like add a bunch of value, and for folks like you that people need your help, like they'll right. find you, but we don't make it like a pitch fest, right? Yeah. Um, and so it's mostly experienced investors, so the conversation level, the networking is just Different. next level yeah. versus like, I'm Especially when it's value driven, when, yeah. when it's coming from a place of, hey, let me just teach you, and right. then if, if, it, if we can collaborate, then great. Yeah, so we've got just, it's really, if you look at the speaker lineup uh, in the, um, um, it's uh, milliondollarmeeting.co. And we'll have all we'll in the description. Link, yeah, down yeah below, in the description of the video, um, we'll we'll have and in the show notes for the podcast, you guys will be able to see all of yep. the links. Yep. And uh, but um, if you see who the speakers are, it's like a who's who list of yeah. just amazing people. And and I'll and I'll say this too. And I said this yesterday. We did a little live thing uh, on Facebook yesterday. Is that there's people like Nicole, Rob Swanson, Matt Andrews, people that that are like legends. People know them really really well. And then there's people that are, and some of these are like members of my mastermind, for example, that yeah. are running like eight figure a year wholesale businesses and nobody knows who they are. And they're cool with that. They don't want a podcast. They yeah. don't want to be in the limelight. They're just they're practic- actually doing the business. They're actually doing the business. <laughs> they're practitioners with their head down yeah. doing the business. And they're like telling me like, I'm really nervous to speak. And I'm like, you are, an, you are amazing. Right. Yeah. Like, what do you have to be worried about? But yeah. you know, so one of the benefits is we have just some amazing content that's shared but it's not stuff you've really heard before because these yeah. people just don't get out and speak as much. So it's a combination of you know both those folks. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, well, I'm excited. Um, if you guys want to learn more about the event, um, like I said, it's going to be in the description, so you guys can go there. I'll be there, so if you guys say hi, if, if you end up coming. Um, and then the other thing that I wanted you to talk about was we talked about the leads. So when you got yeah. in, you're saying that you did the um, – with mailers and the paid leads. So talk about what you offer investors because I think it's so unique. Um, yeah. he, when we had this conversation, I was blown away at, at just how specific you guys were able mm-hmm. to um, really dial down the data. Yeah. And you know, people can go to have systems like Batch Leads and all these other programs, but then they're having to figure out how to stack these lists. And, and what right. you do is so specific and it works, obviously. I mean, yeah. you do this on such a high level and you're, it's nationwide, correct? That's right. Okay. Yeah. So if you guys, because we have listeners from all over the country. Sure. So. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So tell us about that, your, your lead program. So what we, when we first started, you know, when I first started even 14 years ago, we knew you could go pull a probate list or try to find lists that indicate distress, right? Yeah. So how do you market to, it wasn't that long ago, back in those days, 2008, 9, 10. Yeah. Honestly, most investors are still doing this. Most kind of gurus still teach this yeah. because it's easy to say and it's easier to execute, but it's right. just not effective anymore, right. which is to mail to people that are over 65 and they have at least 50% equity, like right. agent equity lists, right? That's most yeah. what most people do. Those are the easiest ones to go pull from the prop streams of the world. And I won't, I have friends at all these companies. I, I won't say anything bad about anybody. I don't really have anything bad to say about anybody, but they, but they have limitations, right? right? And we do too, but we're, we're just kind of next level in what we do. So, um, 
you know, people knew you could go pull specialty lists that indicate distress and you should spend more effort on those and they're going to cost you a little bit more. The effort to get them is a little bit harder and people tolerate that because it should be, a, it should result in a better lead when you get it. Right. right. Um, and so we've just taken that to a whole nother level because uh, my biggest, so I've been, you know, like I said, I coach newbies for a long time, like tons of people from coast to coast. And the biggest question is always around lead generation. What's the best list to mail to? Right. What's the best start, list yeah. to market to? Over and over again. And people would ask that question like a hundred times in like a month. And we're like, what didn't, what didn't you like about my last answer? Like, <laughs> why aren't you doing it? So the it? same thing, yeah. But it's people are afraid to do it. Right. And they're afraid to push the button to pay for it. And it's just like, it, it just, you know, is difficult. Um, and so, and you know, there are always people that teach, I'm going to teach you how to go into the courthouse and pull the probate list or something. It's like, okay, nobody wants to do that. Like nobody wants to do that. Right. That's right. a pain in the butt yeah. and it's one list. And so we've just built out a system now where we literally have, and I, I would love to tell you that we have all this like high technology that allows us to do this. And we've actually built some pretty amazing software, but we literally have humans. Uh, almost 100 full-time data miners now wow. that go into 360 counties at this point across the country on a daily and weekly basis and mine data. That's insane. And you, we've used bots and some other things. And for people that are listening, like, why wouldn't you use bots for that? It actually goes against the terms and, and of service of almost all these counties. So when they catch you doing that or you start doing it consistently, they find a way to just block your IP address or turn you off. Wow. Um, and so they could block your access altogether. But with humans, we go, we go in and we create training programs on how to capture... Uh, 40 different lists that we're going after, probates, notice of default, mowing liens, and we're looking outside of real estate even, like divorce, recent divorce, recent arrest records. We scour a bunch of sites looking for distressed rentals that are posted, and yeah. we just get, gather all this information, right, that we append together. And so there are some amazing list stackers out there. Batch has a great list stacker, and I love those guys. They're sponsors at Investor Fuel. I'm going to be with them next week in yeah. Arizona. Um, but you have to bring your own data and stack right. it up, right? Or you can buy it from them. But the list that we're talking about, they don't have, you know, probably most of them. Um, and instead of just looking at regular list stackers that say, how many lists was it on? Which is like, this is on four lists, so it must be better than the one that's on three lists. Is we actually score every list so that a probate is higher than a mowing lien. Um, and they have a shelf life that dies out over time. So we're getting so mass amounts of distressed local accurate. data, yeah. and we're scoring it at a high level so that we know in every market that we operate in, what is the most distressed person? Like if you had $1 to spend on marketing, who does it go to? Yeah. And if you had 10000 what's the list that it should go to you know, per month? And then we do the marketing for you, so completely done for you, uh, direct mail and skip tracing and all those things. What I love about that is, so I'm all about simple, right? Yeah. So the, I, when people ask me like, hey, what is the best place to go to, you know, and I'm excited too, because I'm gonna definitely add you to our um, list of preferred, oh, great. because people, that's the number one question. Like you said, you heard yeah. this a hundred times and you're like, I said the same answer over and over again. Yeah, what did, because, you, what did you not like about what I said last time? Because it can be overwhelming. <laughs> like it when is. you open a, um, a program, so I can talk about this because I don't have, um, a program right to sell so prop stream <laughs> when I opened it I was like okay this is so overwhelming yeah. and when you're when you're having when you first of all when you are trying to execute your best your time well spent best spent needs to be on actually getting the deals for sure and it shouldn't be if you're if you're an investor and you're trying to spend all this time getting data like you're not going to be able it's to do it's a full-time job it yeah is. and the truth is is you know there's some details we have some costs to join and yeah and management fees and stuff, stuff like that. But on an ongoing basis, at its simplest form, um, after somebody joins us, it's a thousand dollar a month management fee. Like you couldn't pay somebody to do that. And no, we're you doing would spend it more on on a, on a <laughs> VA or or someone else that you don't know yeah. to do that. A hundred percent. Yeah, it's um, you know, it's true. I think that a lot of real estate investors, and we talked about this before, with you know, not hiring the right people. Some of it is also at the very beginning. We're, especially if you had a coach or you were kind of taught, we're taught to be very cheap, right? Yeah. We're trying to buy cheap houses, get them at a discount, never pay retail through your contractors, get investor friendly contractors or right. work with people that are all going to work at a discount. And it's like at some level, like, do you want like a discount heart surgeon too? Like at some level, it's like, right. I'll pay the most. Like I want the best, right? I don't want buy one, get well, one free LASIK. I, I and think so people for your learn the hard way. I'm yeah. sorry. What are you saying? I was going to say for your marketing, you should be willing to spend a little bit more if it's more effective. Yeah. Right. And then coupled with what you do is find more we more ways to monetize those deals that you're throwing away. No, 100%. Right, and then it makes sense. Well, what I was gonna say was that I think 
that people just have to learn the hard way because yeah. what happens is people come to me all the time for mentorship, right? And then the people that don't understand the value of paying someone to fast track them, they spend more money doing it the hard way and they lose not only actual money but time. Yeah. And then when they realize that they spent 10 times more trying to do it themselves right. and they give up, then they're like, oh, I'll pay you $1,000, I'll pay you $20,000, i will pay you yeah. whatever just so I don't have to go through that. Exactly. And I mean, I, I've spent $30,000 just on the wrong leads or losing actual deals because I just didn't know on something. Yeah. And I tell people that I'm like, it may take me five minutes to regurgitate this to you, but it cost me $30,000 to learn that lesson. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah. So it, there is so much value you know what, in something like the, that. Like what does it cost the average real estate investor? Cause this is what a, the average real estate investor does is if they're sending direct mail or they're skip tracing lists or whatever, to let's just say you have this you have to have a process of like the first of the month we yep. do this to feed us for the next month and so inevitably there are real estate investors that um it's like the middle of the month and they haven't done it yet and they're like oh crap i really got to get this done we're not getting any leads right now and then they're like well what's the list we're going to mail to we didn't pull the new list like we'll just send it to the same one we sent it last month it's like what does that cost you that's so wasteful you're mailing to people that have already sold their house yep. you're mailing to people that said take you off the list and but you've got those in a spreadsheet somewhere and it doesn't even you haven't yeah, even like it mixed it in, yeah. and you have outdated data because you're a month old, if not a year old. I mean, I don't know about you. I get text messages from people that want to buy. I have a bunch of rentals, yeah. or people houses that I flipped over the years that want to buy a X Y Z address, and I'm like, I haven't owned this in three years. Like, yep. where did they get that list from? Is somebody selling that, or are they just? Finding some they old have to lists. be because I'm associated with so many properties and I get the same random messages and I'm like, I don't even remember that, that house. <laughs> yeah, like, let me look what it are up. you talking oh my about? God, that was let three years look. ago. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it's crazy. And, and p because people think that sometimes just executing is enough. Right. And, and that's great because that's what will separate you from everyone else. But right. if you don't spend the time to get the right data and to do the right thing, it, you spend so much money. Like right. it's, no it's doubt. crazy. No doubt. So, well, that's awesome. Um, but And if you guys want to learn more about that, we'll also put that in the description. Um, so you said you have multiple multiple events. So we talked about the Million Dollar Mastermind. Um, talk about the, the other one. The yeah, so Million Bill. Dollar Meeting is, million dollar meeting. Is, uh, is an event that we do have been doing once a year for four years now. And that's just kind of a one-off. And then I have Investor Fuel, my mastermind, which actually is next week in Scottsdale. I'm um, flying out this Sunday. And um, that's we've been um, running Investor Fuel we, we started about four and a half years ago. Yeah. And so next week we'll have somewhere between 150 and 170 members uh, that are there with us. And we have a couple different groups without, you know, getting too complicated here. But we basically yeah. just come together and act as a board of advisors for one another. And every, every single member gets up and presents on what's working and what's not working. What do they have That's challenges awesome. with? And then everybody, and then we take time for everybody to help them solve that problem or start the process at least. Like, Let's sit together at dinner tonight. You need to sit next to that guy because he just went through that and he'll tell you exactly how he solved that problem. And so we're connecting people and all helping one another. And we, we really, it's just for professional investors. So we've got, we have two groups, one that for people doing 10 to 50 deals a year and then one for doing 50 and above. And so we've got people in our group that are doing five or 600 deals a year. And yeah. the knowledge in that room is just amazing. I mean, masterminds changed my life. Yeah. And, and to be in a room with, people that are willing to get up and share, I mean, right. is absolutely incredible. Like we're a part of the same mastermind with family mastermind and right. just being able with Matt Andrews does such an amazing job being like, you need to talk to this person and you need to talk to this person. Yep. He's so intentional. And you know, when I started going to masterminds and really it was super humbling because first of all, I was the most inexperienced person in the room and I just sat there like, oh, okay, it, it really changed my version of success, like in my yeah. mind, yeah. because in my mind, I thought if I was working my ass off <laughs> and, I, and I was doing the work that I was successful. And then I realized like, no, like, true success is buying back my time. True success is building That's a right. business that I can turn off my phone and nothing will get on fire. <laughs> everything will be fine. And it just rewired like, you know, everything, how I thought and my whole perspective. Um, I remember one time I was sitting at a mastermind and this guy said that he works 10 hours a week and he is so productive in those 10 hours and he has figured out a way to 
just run this billion dollar business with 10 hours a week. And I, and I couldn't wrap my brain around it. Like yeah. I was the three or four years into the business and I'm like, what are you talking about? It might take me 10 hours a day, but he, <laughs> and he was talking about how his routine is how he like meditates in the morning and how he, you know, hangs out with his kids. And then, then he focuses on those two hours a day. And I was like, what? When do you work? Yeah. I know exactly. But you he hire created it. Things, right. right? Yeah. And, and those 10 hours was, you know, what he, he loved doing, right? Like how he was creative, how he can help, you know, monetize and, and continue to grow. And then I realized like talking to individuals like yourself, they've been doing this for so long. Like there's so much value to it. Yeah. And I, and I think people underestimate that. Like they don't get it. Like they don't understand the power of talking yeah. to someone that has been through it. When people come to uh, our mastermind, in my experience, there's really two common scenarios aside from people that just adapt right in right away a lot of times people know other people in the room and they're comfortable with that but another couple common scenarios are they hold back on giving because they yeah. they just feel like oh, i've got some secret that i can't share or i'm a little hesitant to share and then they get so much value while they're there so you we actually asked them to send us our presentations in advance. You know how yeah. investors are or <laughs> entrepreneurs were like doing it at the last minute. Um, but we asked them to send them in advance and it's pretty common. Like I need to update my presentation because uh, like the bar was set so high. They want to yeah. raise the bar. I feel like I, I've gotten so much I need to give more. That's which awesome. is really cool that that happens. And then the other That's thing contagious. is. Yeah, it, it is. Giving is contagious, right? Yeah. Sharing is contagious. And when you want to reciprocate, when you get a lot right. of value from somebody, you're like, how can I help you? Like, yeah. let me tell you this thing that I thought was a secret that I'm going to share with you. Then yeah. you find out, well, it really wasn't a secret anyway. Half the room's already doing that, you know? Yeah. Uh, and then the other thing is that um, people will think they're like a big dog because they came from their market and they get in a room and they're just like a little puppy, you know, oh, which yeah. is fine. I mean, it's, it's, there's nothing wrong with that. The opportunity to grow is more than you thought, right? Right. Yeah. Well, your perspective creates your possibilities. So when you're in a room and you realize, my goals were were really small. I mean, that's exciting yeah. to be in those rooms, and it's awesome that you have a, a platform for that. So, um, if you guys haven't, definitely check out Mike and the products that he offers. I mean, just being able to be in a room with some of the people, because I've seen um, the people that go to Investor Feel alone with your relationships, right. and it's it's a powerful room. Yeah. So, and you know, even in addition to what you learn there, as entrepreneurs, like you know, it's a kind of a lonely world. Like you get it in is. your foxhole, you're in your office here, yeah. you work hard, your head is down, you're talking to your employees and your maybe your family members every once in a while. But you're like, I need to be around other people like me. That, that like gives minded. me energy, right? Yeah. And so uh, we call it, um, basically, I refer to Investor Fuel as my second family. I mean, you know, I, I last year I took like 30 people to Cabo. We're doing it again this year, and it'll probably be more than that. We travel together. We just built lifelong friendships together, you know. Yeah. And to get around our crew and our tribe and build that is hard to do with our high school friends and our college friends and not taking anything away from those people, but yeah. it's just different, right? Well, I think we're, we're just in a different world anyway. I mean, yeah. and crazy, to, we're yeah, nuts. crazy. I mean, <laughs> you have to be something wrong mentally to That's be right. able to do this at a high level and, and keep doing it every day after shit hits the fan all the time. Yeah. I always say, I'm like, when it rains, it pours. So in real estate, it's either the best month ever and it's going amazing or literally <laughs> everything has all shit has hit the fan and you're just putting out fires like crazy. So when yeah. it's really good. It's good. And when it's bad, it's really bad. So, um, all right. Well, thank you so much for coming. I really yeah, appreciate great it. Great to be here. I enjoyed our conversation, and I think that you offered so much value, especially for investors that are looking to not only grow um, their business, but you know, people that are just getting started. It's always encouraging to hear other people's stories of like, hey, I had to put my head down, and I had I had to hustle in order to get here. So, right, right. All right. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us, and we'll see you next time.